God, we stand in awe of you. You are indeed high above all nations. And who is like our God? Mighty in power and beautiful and worthy of all glory and honor and praise. And yet so humble that you would become one of us in order to die and redeem us. And we praise you for that. And God, we thank you so much for the church that you have given us, this body of believers that we belong to, united together by the blood of Christ and the Spirit of God. We thank you for an opportunity to come together and gather like this on a Sunday, but we thank you for all the different ways in which your church, the body of Christ, is woven into our lives, from home Bible studies to various fellowship groups, family churches, and different ministries. We thank you for your bride, the church, and the invitation you've extended to us to belong to the bride. Lord, I stand here and look out at this congregation, at these faces, and you know every single person in this room this morning. You created them. You have given them life. You've numbered the hairs on their head. You know every intimate detail about them. You know them even more than they know themselves. And so you know exactly how to meet their needs this morning. You know how to minister to them. And I pray that you would do that. I pray that you would do that through the fellowship of their brothers and sisters around them and the encouragement that we sing in the songs that we praise you with and in the teaching of the word, and through, of course, the power of your Holy Spirit. Would you come and work in our hearts and our lives? Draw us close to Jesus. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Last week, I gave a brief overview of the book of First Peter. So now we're going to dive into this text in a little bit more detail. And we're typically, as we make our way through First Peter, going to look at just a couple of verses each week. And I love to preach like this, just chewing on a few verses at a time. I mean, Scripture is so rich. There's so much you can draw out of the text. And I think uh, taking just a couple verses at a time allows us to really go deep and think very carefully about what Scripture is teaching us. But there is a potential downside to this approach to God's Word. There's always the danger that in looking super close at Scripture, that we would kind of forget the the big picture. We'd forget how all these pieces fit together as a whole. You know, kind of like building a puzzle. If you're looking at one piece, that's important because you got to figure out where it goes. But the goal is to understand how it all works to make one united picture. The reason I'm bringing this up is because as we study 1 Peter together, I want to encourage you to actually be reading this book at home. Um, I want you to Maybe read one chapter each week as we are looking at the text. So we're going to be in chapter one for a while. I think it would serve you well to read chapter one maybe once a week. Or maybe you want to read all of First Peter each week. I don't think that that would take you more than maybe 30 minutes in a week. And so the point is, as we look closely at this text together as a church on Sunday, uh, I want to just remind you, that it's important to not lose the the bigger picture, okay? Today we're going to look just at verses 1 and 2, and actually there's so much in verse 2 that we're going to look at verse 2 again next week. Uh, But let's read this together. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. John, you're laughing, because it's going to take us two weeks, is that why? Yeah. All right, well, let's get into it. This book of the Bible here was originally a letter. It was written by the Apostle Peter. We looked at that in detail last week. It was written by him, but it was written through the power and wisdom and inspiration of the Holy Spirit that is God. 
And so the letter begins with an introduction. It introduces us to the human author who composed these words. That author is Peter, who calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. And since we talked about Peter last week, I want to talk about Jesus Christ, the one who gave Peter this ministry as an apostle. Believe it or not, there's a lot that we can learn just from these two words, Jesus Christ. His name is not Jesus Christ, as if Jesus is his first name and Christ is his last name. He is Jesus by name and he is the Christ by title. Like MVP or CEO or president, Christ is a title and it means Messiah or it means anointed one. In fact, in first, or John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 41, we find Andrew who meets Jesus, and he goes to find his brother, Simon Peter, and he says to Simon Peter, come and see, we've found the Messiah. And John it inserts into the text there a little parentheses where he says, which means the Christ. So these words are interchangeable, Christ and Messiah, and they come to us from the Old Testament. First, from Leviticus chapter 4, where we find the priests who are called the anointed one, and it's the role of the priest to make atonement for the sins of God's people, to put an end to sin and atone for iniquity. And then we find the words again in Daniel chapter 9, and there we are told a prophecy about a prince who will come to lead and redeem his people, to atone for their sin as well. This is Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. He is the one who fulfills these ancient prophecies of expectation for deliverance and salvation and redemption. He's God's servant, sent to save people from the ruin of sin that's fallen upon them because of their rebellion. And the name Jesus also speaks to this reality because the name Jesus comes to us from the Old Testament as well. It's the Hebrew name Yahoshua, Joshua, and it means God is salvation. You might remember from the Old Testament the character Joshua. He followed in the footsteps of Moses after Israel was brought out of slavery in Egypt. Moses passed on the mantle of leadership to a young man named Joshua who would take the people of Israel from wandering in the wilderness into the promised land. And so Jesus is the anointed Son of God who leads his people from slavery to sin into the promised kingdom of God by making atonement through his sacrificial blood. This is why the Bible then teaches us in Acts chapter 4, there is salvation in no other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So there's a whole lot of theology and truth and beauty wrapped up just in the name Jesus Christ. And as Christians, all of our hope is found in this perfect God-man, the Messiah, the Savior. And Peter starts his letter by invoking the name of Jesus because more than anything, Peter would have us look to the Christ to fix our eyes upon him. So I would ask you this morning, have you looked to this Messiah? I think most people know deep down inside that they're in need of a Savior. Lots of people think they're good, but I think lots of people also wonder if they're just quite good enough. Are you weary and burdened of your sins and your failures? Do you feel that voice of shame and condemnation in the back of your mind? Then look to Jesus, the one who delivers from slavery to sin. Are you burdened by your pain or your fear 
or your anxiety concerning the future, you don't need a therapist. You need to turn to Christ, the Son of God, for the healing that you need, for the hope that you're looking for, for the comfort that you long for. Look to him. Follow him. Trust him. He is the salvation which God is offering to you right now in this moment. His blood was shed so that you might be rescued. And all you must do is look to him. I pray that you would trust him with all of your heart, not just once, but every day, this day and for always. Then after writing his own name and pointing his readers to Jesus, Peter gives us the address for this letter. Where is it headed? Who is he writing to? Well, he's writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So this is a letter that was meant to be circulated among a group of churches so they could all be encouraged and edified by the truth and the wisdom of the Spirit of God as expressed in the writing of Peter. These churches were located in a region known as Asia Minor. Maybe you've got a map in the back of your Bible. Typically, you'll find an area of kind of the New Testament lands where the gospel was spreading. Today, we can think of this area as the westernmost part of the continent of Asia. Uh, it would be around the Black Sea on the southern side, stretching all the way down to the Mediterranean. If you were to look at a modern map, it would be the nation of Turkey for the most part. And we find a number of the cities that Peter mentions here referenced in different places throughout the Bible, particularly in Acts. Paul passed through this region, planting churches during his missionary journeys. And he even wrote a letter to one of these churches, the church in Galatia. And so you've got the book in your Bible called Galatians. But Peter doesn't actually call them churches. He doesn't say to the churches in these different cities. Instead, he uses a poetic language where he says to the elect exiles. Now, he is addressing churches, so don't misunderstand. These are communities of Christians located in these different cities and regions, but the way that he addresses them is, is beautiful and unique and worth examining. He says he's writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion. And notice that the dispersion, at least in the ESV version, uh, is a capital D. Uh, I think that means that it's pointing to a particular event. Last week I told you that in AD 64, the Emperor Nero began a campaign of persecution against the Christians. Well, that wasn't actually the very first conflict that occurred between the Romans and the Christians. Uh, there was other things boiling beneath the surface before that. There's a Roman historian named Suetonius, and he records that in AD 49, the Emperor Claudius issued an edict expelling all of the Jews and all of the Christians from the city of Rome forcing them to relocate to other cities in the empire. Suetonius, who was not a Christian himself, records in his history that the reason the emperor expelled the Jews and the Christians was over a debate they were having regarding a man named Crestus. And most historians agree that he's referring to Jesus. This means that not too long after Jesus rose from the dead, the Jews began to see Christianity as a unique religion, not as a sect within Judaism, but as a totally different pathway away from the traditions of the Jews. And they believed that this religion was then perverting Judaism, and it was sort of like a parasite pretending to be Jewish and getting the benefits that the Jews got from the Romans. And so the Jews began to raise hell across the Roman Empire, bringing attention to the Romans that the Jews and the Christians were not the same. Well, the emperor, Claudius, didn't really want to get involved in the argument, so he does what you might do as a parent when your kids are fighting. Just everybody go to your rooms. He just threw them all out of Rome and said, go figure it out someplace else. 
And this led to what Peter here calls the dispersion, where the followers of Jesus were dispersed across the Roman Empire, expelled from Rome, resettling in different cities around the Roman Empire. But more importantly, Peter uses the word exiles here to describe these Christians to whom he is writing. His real concern is not that Christians have been expelled from the capital city, Rome, but that Christians in this world are exiles. So you have the material reality, Christians have been banished from Rome, but you have a spiritual reality that's far more significant to Peter. Christians are exiles, strangers in a strange land. We live here in this world, but we're displaced. Our hearts understand deep down that this this place is not our home. Don't you feel like you don't fit? Don't you feel like you long for something else? And this word exile has deep importance within the story of the Bible. See, one of the major themes of the Old Testament when you read it is the exile of the Jews. God had made a covenant with the Jewish people, and that covenant entailed that if they were faithful to him and they loved him and they obeyed his commands, then God declared that they would be safe and secure in the promised land. If their hearts were true to him and they worshipped him alone, he would care for them and Israel would be their inheritance forever. But God also said that if they broke faith with him and they disobeyed him, then he would send in other nations to conquer them and drag them away from Israel, to subdue them and destroy them. And tragically, Israel did break faith with God. They became corrupt. They instituted all kinds of religious abominations among God's treasured people. And so they were eventually conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they were dragged off to the nation of Babylon and resettled in that land as a consequence for their sin. They were taken into exile. First Chronicles chapter 9 verse 1 says, the people of God were taken into exile in Babylon because of their breach of faith. And life in Babylon was hard for the Jews. They were in captivity. They were away from their homeland. They were taken away from the temple of God. They were forced to live among a people who did not know their religion or serve their God or honor them as God-fearing people. Now, the reason why Peter brings this up is because he understands that the picture of Israel in exile in the Old Testament points to the experience of Christians living this life in this world. And the picture is similar. The Christian life is a life of exile. But the picture is also different because the reason for our exile is different. See, the Jews were sent into exile because they broke faith with God. So they were forced to live among people who did not respect them or God. But Christians, we are in exile. We live among a people who do not respect us or our God. But we're not in exile because we have disobeyed God like Israel. No, we are in exile because we do obey God. We live as strangers in a strange land. We are despised and hated by the world simply by virtue of the fact that we do love God and we seek to obey and honor him with our lives. We live among rebels, but our loyalty is to the king that they oppose. And so we're hated and despised because we follow a man named Jesus And the world rejects us and we feel like foreigners because our message begins with this truth that man is wicked and sinful and God is full of wrath because of our evil rebellion against him. And of course, that's not the end of the message because the message is also full of hope 
We invite people to repent and believe in Jesus and receive from him mercy and love. We tell them, throw down your rebel arms. Raise the white flag of surrender and your life will be spared by this king. He will embrace you and love you and honor you for serving him. But even though we proclaim that message as strangers in a strange world, for the most part we are rejected and despised. The world falsely accuses us of being self-righteous and full of hate. Even though we preach a message of repentance that leads to God pouring out immeasurable love and grace upon those who come to him. And so here we are, exiles, living our lives in this world, but being hated by this world because we do not participate in the evil of this world. This is not our home. Our hearts ache for a greater kingdom where Jesus is Lord. And while we live this life waiting to go home to that eternal kingdom where Christ rules and reigns among his people, in this life we must live lives that correspond to that kingdom and not this kingdom. Lives of righteousness and light and truth, not lives full of lies and darkness that corresponds with this broken world. And so Peter will write in his letter in chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So a big part of Peter writing this letter is to encourage Christians to endure the hardship of living in exile, where persecution and hardship is sure to come to us. He writes in order to teach these Christians how to live their life during this time when we are in exile, while we wait for the new heaven and the new earth. And that's helpful. Because it's hard to live in this world, isn't it? It's hard to keep your eyes on Jesus. It's hard to not grow discouraged. It's hard to have a heart that longs for home and then look around at this world and see so much despair and pain and heartache. It might lead us to wonder, how do we keep pressing on? And Peter just reminds us that we are exiles and we wait to go home. And I hope that Peter's letter will be an encouragement to us as we live through our exile. But Peter doesn't just use the word exiles to re refer to his audience. He calls them elect exiles. Now this is a controversial word, and I'm not one to skip over controversial words in the Bible. So we're going to deal with this word. It will serve us to talk about the doctrine of election since Peter uses this word. But before I get into the controversy, let me point out that Peter connects election and exile. I think it's fair to say that in Peter's mind, part of God's elective choice for his people is that they have been elected to suffer. Did you hear what I just said? God has chosen for his people to experience the suffering of exile. Maybe you've been told that the Christian life is all and only about blessing and prosperity and goodness and happiness and joy and something must be wrong with you if you don't feel all of those things. Peter tells us, that God has chosen for us to experience exile. Don't you understand that if God wanted to, at the moment that you became a Christian, he could whisk you away to the kingdom of heaven where you would have no more pain and tears or sorrow or suffering, but that's not what God does. 
Instead, he redeems us and then leaves us here as exiles among rebels. And the world hates us. And that hatred produces suffering. And yet it is God's intention that we would suffer. We're told in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. To be chosen in Christ is also to be chosen to suffer. You cannot escape it. Again, we're told, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. So part of God's election is for us to have the honor of suffering as we are transformed more into the image of Christ in this life. The testing of our faith that comes through persecution and hardship in order that we might become the kind of people who are steadfast in character. And Peter will go on to tell us in chapter 4 that we should not suffer because we are obnoxious or proud or arrogant or because we flaunt our self-righteousness to a doubting world. We should not suffer Hatred from the world because when they hate us, we respond with evil and hate them back. No, we've been chosen to suffer because we have been chosen to be a light, to be transformed into the image of Christ. And God will be with us in the suffering of our exile just as he was with Christ in the suffering of the cross. Now let's talk about this word election. I I warned you it was coming. What does election actually mean? What does it mean that these exiles are elect by God? Well, living in America, we know what election means. We go through one every couple of years. We all go crazy when it happens. And we get to go and make a choice about who we want to be our leaders. So to elect is to choose. So Peter is saying that God has chosen these exiles, chosen them to be his, and chosen them to suffer. But since many people struggle with this topic and the nature of God, what does it say about God that he elects? And the nature of man, what does it say about man that we are elected? I want to say three things that I hope will help. First, as Christians, we must be willing to accept what Scripture teaches us about God. What God has chosen to reveal about himself in his word. As Christians... We must bring ourselves to submit to what God has revealed. At the foundation of all of this is a principal truth that man has emphatically tried to reject since Adam and Eve ate the fruit and disobeyed God and placed themselves in the position of God. And here's the truth. God is God. God is God. Which is to say that God can do whatever he wants. And because he is God, what he does is good. And because he is God, what he does is right. Go read the book of Job. In some ways, it's an incredibly disappointing book. You long for an answer to the question, And the answer is, God is God. Go read Isaiah chapters 40 through 60. Go read any of the prophets for that matter. Go read the book of Revelation or the first six chapters of Genesis. Or look more closely once again at what Jesus says about faith and redemption. That no man can come to him unless the Father draws him. And so we must not harden our hearts to the truth that God is God. And God is good. 
And therefore, whatever God does is best. And accepting this most basic fact of Christianity is essential to submitting to him as God. You are not God. He is. And he does not owe you an explanation. He doesn't need to give you a reason. He does not need to respect your feelings or your opinions or anything that you think about him. He doesn't need to respect what, or he doesn't need to explain what he thinks or what he does or what he says to you. He actually doesn't even need you to agree or accept what he says. Now, God cares about your thoughts and your feelings. This God who is the infinite creator of all the universe actually is so lowly that he cares about the things that you think about. That's true. But they can do nothing to alter the nature or the character of this God. He is who he is. You are his creature. You are so powerless that you can't even determine the number of your days. You cannot prolong your life beyond the years which God has given you. And he, he is God, the giver of life, the all-wise, all-powerful, eternal God. And there's actually overwhelming peace and accepting this truth, isn't there? There's wonderful hope in clinging to the fact that God is God. If you'll only bring yourself to accept it. But it doesn't end there, because the second thing we need to understand about election, it comes to us from that opening chapter of Ephesians. You heard it read by Audrey a little bit ago. We're told in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, these words. In love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Why does God elect people? In love. Love is what motivates God to save people. So if you are looking for an explanation, if you want to say, God, explain to me why you would do it this way, here's the answer. Love. Accept this explanation straight from the Word of God. God, in love, predestined us to be children of God. Election is not a cold, hard, theological truth. It is a warm and tender revelation about the heart of our God. God saves people. God rescues people. God enters in to redeem and show His love. In love, God gave His Son as a sacrifice for our sin that we might be saved. Look at the cross and let the hot tears of sorrow and joy flow mingled down. God chose you because He loves you with an everlasting love. Even when you were His enemy and you were a rebel, even when you hated God, God loved you. And this brings us to my last point about election. God must act in love to elect you because although you do have a will that is free to make real, true, meaningful choices, before God elected you, you were a God-hater. That was your identity before you became a child of God. You would never have come to this God who tells you that you were a miserable wretch, wicked, broken, in ruin, who must submit to him for mercy. Who would come to God on those terms? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, You were dead in your sin following the course of this world, enslaved to the spirit of disobedience, held captive by the self-destructive passions of your flesh, and therefore a child of wrath as a God-hater. 
Look, I believe what the Bible clearly teaches on this subject, which is to say I believe that man has a will. You have a will with which you must make choices, choices that are of the utmost consequence to you and your life. But that will that you have is by nature so utterly broken and corrupt by sin, so horribly suspicious of this God of love, so envious of this God who is God and you are not God, that you would never turn to God without Him first, lovingly electing you. We are free to make real and meaningful choices, but without God's intervention, our choices have only the freedom of a single direction, which is away from God. I love to go to Disneyland. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I mean, I take every opportunity I can to go to Disneyland, okay? I'm begging my wife all the time, can we go to Disneyland? But when I was a kid, I, I lived in Southern California for a few years. So we had an annual pass and we'd go to Disneyland all the time. And my favorite ride as like a seven-year-old, you know what it was? The Autopia cars. Have you driven these cars? As a little kid, you can drive them. They're on this track, and they, they go through this huge area of Disneyland. It's really awesome. And I thought those cars as a kid was the greatest thing in the world. Right? There was no way my dad was ever going to like give me the keys to the car and put me behind the steering wheel and let me drive the car. But at Disneyland, I had this incredible freedom. I could hop on one of these cars. I could drive by myself. The whole world was mine as I raced through this track in Disneyland, this wide open landscape. And I could smash that gas pedal and I could just fly down that track and nobody could stop me as I cruised all of Disneyland like a boss. <laughs> but you know what I eventually came to see? It was all a scam. I could only move one direction, and that was forward. And even if I tried to stop, somebody would smash me from behind. I was harried to keep moving forward, forward, always forward. And I could see all this freedom around me to the right and to the left, these beautiful bushes and areas where I would have loved to drive my car, these secret places where I could see Disneyland workers going that I couldn't go. And I was stuck on this track, unable to break free. As an ignorant child, I thought I was free. But I began to see in time that the freedom of the track was really slavery. I had been deceived into thinking that I had power and freedom, but I could only go one direction. And in my ignorance as an unwise child, I was actually super content like, you could have left me at Disneyland and I just would have gone right back to the line and just kept riding those cars around that track forever because I found it thrilling and I could not see the lie that I was stuck in. Friends, this is the human will captured by sin. Sin calls us forward. It deceives us and says you're free. It lies and tells us out there where God would have you be truly free. No, 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 no. That's a kind of slavery. Sin will not let us go out into the true freedom which God offers in obedience to him. We're stuck on a track, repeating the same behaviors again and again and again. Even though we feel despair, we just keep at it. And as long as we are dumb and content to keep moving forward into more sin, we don't even realize that we're enslaved. We buy the lie that we're free. And we don't see how stupid and manipulative the whole system is. We just keep seeking our little thrills from pressing that gas pedal down. And we just keep cruising down that track of rebellion and destruction. Do you know what the name of that ride means? Autopia? It's a mashup of two words, autos and utopia. Autos comes from Greek and it means self. And utopia is another word for paradise. I'm sure they didn't intend this, but it's a perfect illustration, isn't it? 
This is the lie of sin, that you are a paradise unto yourself, that by your own power and your own will, you can be free and go wherever you want, unrestricted, unhindered. You can choose to do what you want because you, you are a paradise to yourself. You are like God. Nobody can tell you what to do. You're free. But in that self-paradise of false freedom, you will only ever move in the same direction, into greater depths of your own sin, further away from the love and grace of God, into greater loneliness and despair and condemnation. Unless God, by his electing grace, smashes into the barriers of that track and calls you out into the true freedom of his will, unless God moves you off the track of your own sinful self-will, you cannot ever leave. We're enslaved to sin until God turns our will to his own so that we desire what he desires, and we find true freedom in obedience to him. And God can, and God does, do that work in people because he's God and because he loves us. Romans 6, 19 says, For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness... So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. And Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5 tells us, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Let us rejoice that God has elected us to be exiles, that he chose us and plucked us out from the misery and ruin of our self-love, our self-will, so that we could be free in his love. Now, I had at least another 10 minutes of things I wanted to say to you about grace and mercy being multiplied to you, but I said we're going to do verse 2 next week, so you'll just have to wait. Let me close by just saying this. We wander through this life of suffering as exiles, as Christians. Longing for our true home with God. But as we are exiles waiting, we do not despair because we know that God electing us has shown his great love for us. And so we're free. Free to rest in the love of Christ, the Messiah, who has proven that God is able to save. Let me pray. Oh God, we thank you that you have set us free from that lie of sin and that you've released us into the freedom of obedience. And I pray that we would find great joy in that obedience. We thank you that everything that you do for your children is done in love. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the one for whom the whole world was waiting, the one who had come to redeem and restore. God, would you give us great confidence in your love for us, in your will? Would you keep us fixed upon Christ with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength? Amen.